I'm Dan Rogers. I'm the CEO for the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to this budget briefing, and uh, we'll work through the technical challenges. Some of us, uh, me in particular, working remotely, and I've got some challenges on connectivity, but uh, we're pretty confident we'll be able to walk you through uh, this morning and have you out of here uh, before nine o'clock. Thanks for joining us for this budget briefing. Uh, I've got some of the team helping out as well. Uh, so we'll uh, go to the next slide as we move our way through this morning. We're excited to have a couple of specialists from KPMG joining us, uh, Zach Smith and Marina Warrender. Uh, we'll more formally introduce them. Uh, and I particularly want to thank KPMG and uh, Zach and Marina for likely doing a little extra work uh, digesting uh, the budget uh, uh, following it to being tabled yesterday in the legislature. So how this will work, I'll give you a few comments from the uh, chamber perspective as we continue through, and then I'll turn things over to Zach and Marina to give some additional comments. It was interesting yesterday, the uh, Greater Vancouver Board of Trade uh, gave a letter grade of a C minus uh, for the BC budget. Uh, we actually aren't going to assign a letter grade. Uh, it's not something that we looked at doing, but uh, if we were to, it probably would be around NYC, not yet complete uh, because of the missed opportunities uh, to help businesses uh, as part of the pandemic recovery and in light of all the challenges businesses are facing. Interestingly enough, right throughout the pandemic and continuing now, every time we survey our members and small business, we are hearing their concern about BC's competitiveness. And there's little evidence in this plan, at least uh, in the fiscal plan, that there are significant uh, investments to help small business in addressing their ever-increasing cost of doing business. So we'll go to the next slide, uh, give you a bit of an overview. So it focus on uh, the budget focuses on the six themes. I won't go into details about them. It certainly is helping those uh, that, that need help the most. Uh, it's a budget that you would expect uh, from this government. It's consistent with some of what they said leading up to the tabling of the budget. There is some uh, funds set aside for uh, job development. I'll come back to that in a moment. Focus on housing and health is uh, evident both in the operational and the capital side. Go to the next slide. Those so some nuts and bolts on uh, the dollars uh, here. Uh, Thirty-seven point five billion in capital spending on critical infrastructure. So you're going to hear a lot about schools, roads, hospitals. That's a record amount of spending. Um, but don't get too excited. Most of that is for major capital spending in the Lower Mainland. Uh, with some major uh, transportation routes uh, being invested in, in Metro Vancouver area particularly. The debt is continuing to climb. It's forecasted to reach $100 billion at the end of 25-26. It's maybe worth noting, if you're paying attention to these things, that it was dueling budget day yesterday. Alberta tabled its budget. BC tabled its Alberta balanced its budget, and we have deficits in each of the three years of this financial plan. There is also, so you're going to hear a lot of this likely in the media, continued increase in the carbon tax of $15 per ton, working towards about 37 cents per liter by the time it's all done. It's a concern to small businesses. It's going to be a concern to consumers and those that have to use their vehicle to get around but it's gonna impact the cost of goods produced and that in the longer term will also be a contributor to our competitiveness. So we'll go to the next one. As I mentioned, there is some money set aside to help uh, the labor challenges and we're acutely aware of those in the Okanagan with the labor challenges we're seeing and the impact of the cost of doing business with respect to the cost of labor. Um, 480 million is set aside with a future ready plan. It's not a well-defined plan as of yet. They say they're working on it and we'll have more information. There will be a focus within that to help small businesses 
in areas where skill development is a concern. So more to come on that one. 867 million was set aside for mental health and addiction uh, options. We've been uh, working with a variety of our partners, certainly through the BC Chamber, uh, to make sure the government is aware that the outcome of the lack of addressing mental health issues is impacting businesses, impacting employees. So uh, it is a business issue as well. There is money set aside to speed up natural resource permitting. It's another issue of the BC Chamber and we collectively with our colleagues across the province have been making the case uh, that will help us uh, from a provincial economic perspective. A billion is set aside in uh, pandemic economic recovery contingencies. Within that, there is some money for tourism, 20 million uh, set aside to help tourism as, it, as we continue to transition out of the pandemic. 58 million for speeding up the foreign credentials, another key piece for us. Not sure that uh, that's exactly the amount that we were looking for. We we're hoping for a bit more there, but we'll see how this program rolls out because uh, speeding up that foreign credential program uh, will be significant for communities like Kelowna uh, and those outside Metro Vancouver as we try to recruit and retain uh, foreign workers. 180 million uh, BC Manufacturing Jobs Fund has been established. Uh, I just flagged this one because we've worked collectively. It's not likely to impact us in the Okanagan, but it's a big impact for uh, particularly in Northern BC for uh, the mill closures that we're aware of. And this is really targeted to help uh, moving from use of old growth logs to higher value products that'll be uh, probably well received in Northern BC and those communities, even in our region that are tied to the resource sector. Um, I'll move through these slides, uh, Lauren, fairly quickly. 1.1 billion over three years to help communities increase climate resiliency. You're gonna hear some positive aspects out of that, uh, I suspect from local government. Uh, there's a lot on housing. I just picked out a couple, 4.2 billion over three years for new homes. Uh, but there's a focus to that, uh, middle income, low income, indigenous, and there's some uh, focus on student residences. We'll see how that falls out. Most of the projects announced are in Metro Vancouver area, but there could be some opportunities here for UBC Okanagan. 575 million uh, set aside for post-secondary spaces in high demand areas. 462 million, about half a billion in new funding for public safety. I flagged this one. Uh, certainly I was watching Minister Conroy being a, a new finance minister, but more particular, being from the interior, from the Kootenays, to see if there is anything that would be specifically focused to help rural or interior communities. There is money set aside for more RCMP officers, particularly in rural remote areas. So uh, I flagged that one. We are looking to track down the minister. Hopefully she will uh, accept our invitation. We know she's on the speaking tour for the budget. So we hope that we will have her uh, in front of you. Quickly, we'll go to the next one just to wrap these ones up. And I'll move through these ones quickly. We are concerned a little bit about our competitiveness uh, for the lack of attention to helping business with increasing costs, because ultimately that gets passed on to the consumer. We've seen continual uh, tax hikes uh, since 2018 or even before that. The carbon tax is increasing, so you'll see that work its way through the economy. Uh, no movement on the employer health tax threshold. That was something we were seeking to help small businesses, particularly family-owned businesses. And Zach's going to come up on in a minute. Uh, that's his specialty. So uh, I'll likely have a bit of conversation with Zach on that. And we continue to make the case that the speculation tax is just causing money and driving up prices, not solving uh, homelessness in the Okanagan or the communities particularly mentioned here, where it continues to apply. And I touch base on this, but I want to get to our speakers. So um, as I mentioned, uh, there's no focus on balancing the budget. It's a deficit that will climb uh, over the course of the financial plan by 11 billion. There's the outline each year. We'll go to the next one. Uh, we will say there is money built in. It's a fiscal, a prudent fiscal approach, similar to what they've done before. So even the forecast council uh, is estimating growth will be higher than what the government says. 
So you can put that together. So if you're ultra conservative, you have a little bit of money left at the end of the day for those contingencies. They've also set some contingencies aside just in case we have another heat dome or flooding. So uh, we've learned from the past. So uh, the economic growth projections that the ministry is using is even below the forecast council, which is fairly conservative. Uh, we are expected to recover, but it's going to take a while to get to back to where we were pre-pandemic, likely 25 or into 2026. And the last one, just before introducing. Uh, so this is the debt picture. Um, it continues to grow uh, over the course of the financial plan, but it's worth noting uh, because of low interest rates and the government's current AAA rating, it's still that debt is uh, still manageable. So uh, we go to the next one and I'm going to, you can stop my slides now and I'll just uh, cut set here and we'll welcome in if you want to Zach and Marina to turn on your cameras, they'll bring them in as well. And I get to turn things over to you guys. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction. Zach, a uh, new partner, tax partner at KPMG. Uh, so welcome to Kelowna and the Kelowna office. Uh, he's been over 10 years experience specializing in tax efficient solutions for private companies and their shareholders and a real passion for supporting family run enterprises. So we'll see his take or potentially I'll furry a little bit along on what this might mean to those smaller family businesses. And also, uh, we're pleased to have with us Marina Warrender. Uh, she's a senior manager at KPMG and, of course, a chamber board member. Uh, Marina has 12 years' experience providing audit and other accounting services. So uh, thanks, uh, Zach and Marina, for joining us. Which one was going to go first? I don't remember. Well, yeah, I start sharing my screen now so we can actually um, look at so the I'll turn it over to you guys. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Just wait for these slides to come up. Okay, can you see, everybody can see them? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so I'll start us off. So again, thank you, Dan, for that introduction and, and great presentation. Lots of what you touched on, uh, we'll touch on as well. Um, so a bit of overlap. Um, I think everyone knows this this uh, budget. Um, it wasn't necessarily um, business focused. It's very spending focused on what the government deems to be those most in need and 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 very focused on initiatives for individuals, uh, uh, not as much for businesses, which was a bit disappointing because, you know, in my opinion, uh, small businesses is what drives our economy and what drives Canadian, the Canadian economy. Um, so I think they go hand in hand, the integration between the two. But let's get started. So we're going to start with a, a summary of the current economic situation that they presented. So so while unemployment rate is near historic low, so 4.4% in January, there's still uh, high vacancies in certain sectors, which is construction, accommodation, food services. I know we feel in a lot of professional services as well, uh, um, getting staff. So, so, and that ties into a bit of, of what we talked about, uh, what Dan had mentioned and what we're gonna talk about later with the initiative to make it easier for foreign credentials to be uh, uh, recognized. So, so hopefully that helps with that. But again, it's kind of a mixed picture. I find everything's a bit extreme right now. While we have low, while we have low unemployment rates, there's still high vacancies in, in a lot of sectors. So consumer spending on services is starting to recover. So people are starting to travel. Uh, they're spending money on tourism and hospitality, uh, restaurants. But spending on certain goods has has definitely softened, and, and those are things like big ticket items, like vehicles, uh, maybe the bigger vacations, um, um, housing market, of course, and that's usually directly tied to higher costs, and of course, the interest rates. Um, construction is strong, so there's there's lots of units being constructed, uh, so almost forty seven thousand units in twenty twenty two. However, sales activity is low, has lowered. So sales have decreased about 35% in 2022. And, and the MLS average home sale has also softened. So it's fallen almost 18% from February 2022 to January 2023. So inflation has started to ease in January. But again, affordability challenges remain as interest rates remain high. And, and as we know, costs are going up with, with all the inputs. 
And, and finally, the value of, of goods being exported is, is weakening and while service exports uh, are continuing to recover. So, um, so again, I think it's a good news that the interest rates, while they went up in January, the Bank of Canada has signaled its intent to hold rates uh, steady. And so that should help with uh, trade as well. Okay, so now we'll go over the highlights, and then we're going to dive into each of these sections into sections into more detail. So, so really, one of the sections that they talked about was helping people through challenges now. So that was a four point five billion in new spending and credits over the three years. The second uh, highlight was investing in affordable and attainable housing. So four point two billion in funding over three years to build thousands of new homes and invest in communities. Three was keeping BC's community safe and healthy. So that was a uh, uh, 6.4 billion in new public health and mental health care strengthening. And four was advancing BC's strong and sustainable economy. So 1.4 billion in new operating and capital funding and the new, new carbon tax framework. And then last but not least was the, the more uh, 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 fiscal plan with the numbers behind it. So again, we're in a deficit budget of 4.2 billion in 2023-24, going down to 3.8, and then going down to 3 billion in 2025-2026. So again, we're going to talk about all these sections and sections and details. So I'm going to start with uh, helping people through challenges and just some of the highlights that that went into this. So so really the idea in this section was I think they wanted to put money back into individuals pockets and again I, I think the focus was on individuals and not businesses here um so so the first was they're they're, they're contributing 214 million over three years expanding food programs and that's going to be addressing uh, uh student hunger so so um you know i think the idea with that is to to hopefully ease the ease the 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 cost on the parents, of course, um, so the individuals. Um, of course, the big highlight was BC becoming the first jurisdiction to make prescription uh, contraception free to all residents, so birth control. Um, and that's gonna be the first in Canada, the first province in Canada to do that. There's gonna be a 10% increase in the monthly BC family benefits starting in July, 2023. And then there's going to be even additional benefits for single parents, up to $500 uh, uh, per year. So, so really the stats behind that is a single parent could get a $500 top up. Families with children would see, again, the 10% top up. And then a two-parent two family with two children, it could amount to about $250 per year to, to help with food, et cetera. So then another big highlight with this new income-tested renter's tax credit. So it could provide up to $400 annually to renters in 2024, but it is a it is income tested. So pretty much if you're uh, up to 60,000, you can get the full benefit. Between 60 and 80,000, it's it's kind of prorated. And then over 80,000, it essentially gets uh, cut off. So it is in income tested, but they're expecting that to, uh, to to uh, 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 provide as much as 400 mil, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 300 million back into BC renters' pockets per year. Lastly, we talk a lot about the carbon tax rate increase, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, they're planning to increase it 15 tons per year, but on the other side, they're also increasing the BC Climate Action Tax Credit. So that's going to put more money into individuals' pockets. So, so last year, you know, a two-parent family would have received about $500. This year, they'll re receive about $900. Uh, last year, a single person received about 194. This year, they'll receive almost $450. So, so while we are being charged more on a, on a, on a, a carbon tax, uh, you're gonna get more back on this action, uh, the, the tax credit uh, as a rebate. Now, again, what, what we're not hearing about there is, is that climate action tax credit is meant to um, um, reimburse you for your personal carbon tax that you're paying. It doesn't take into consideration all the other carbon taxes that the businesses are paying, paying that are flowing through to your final product cost or service cost. And Dan had mentioned that as well. And finally, um, something that I think is a good initiative is the student loans uh, maximums will double in more flexible repayment terms. 
for lower income graduates. So one thing we're seeing is, is you know, with inflation and, and cost of living, it's becoming more expensive, um, but the student loans, uh, the amount that they receive hasn't increased in 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 um, correspondence with it. And then of course, the, the wages coming out of, of, of college haven't uh, increased with inflation as well as, as fast. So it's, it, it's, it is tough for students coming out of college and trying to make a living um, and trying to afford the cost of living, especially in, in BC. So, so that I'm gonna flip it over to Marina now and you'll hear back from me in, uh, in a few slides here. Thanks, Zach. So I'm going to talk about affordable and attainable housing for a few minutes. Um, so that's one of the next big priorities for our government. Um, so the province is providing 1.7 billion in operating and capital funding over the next three years to support building thousands of new homes, mainly through building BC and BC housing programs and some transit oriented developments. So the transit oriented developments this include 394 million to buy land for thousands of homes near future uh, transit development projects. And this is focused on um, affordable and market housing developments and um, meant to be along main transit corridors. Um, it also includes 66 million in annual operating funding to support new housing developed through the rapid housing initiative. So this is a federal provincial cost shared program addressing housing needs for vulnerable individuals through the rapid construction of affordable housing. Uh, the next big program is 575 million over three years for constructions of thousands of new student housing spaces. And as Dan mentioned, um, a lot of it is going to happen in the lower mainland, but it is supposed to be also including the Okanagan. So we'll hope there will be some development for UBCO coming out of this funding as well. Um, the next big thing is the rental support programs. And Zach has already uh, touched on it because it kind of overlaps in the different programs. But the big one is one of the big ones is the new income tested renters tax credits that we already discussed. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, there are a couple of other programs as well. So 230 million over 10 years to improve BC's housing rental stocks that is uh, getting older and older, um, but also supposed to increase some additional housing. 15.6 uh, million over three years for the residential tenancy branch. So that will hopefully help with uh, backlog and improve service delivery and timely dispute to the resolution. Um, there are also some smaller initiatives that I didn't put on here, but the goal is to reduce time and costs associated with local government approval processes, which would be nice to see. And also a private pilot project to provide financing and incentives to encourage homeowners to develop new secondary streets for their principal residencies. So meaning you have your primary home and trying to put a suite in there, or like in Kelowna, we would call it the carriage house. There are no details about what that funding looks like right now, but there is money set aside for that. Um, another part of it is the homelessness initiative as part of this. Um, so there's a significant, significant new investment of 640 million to deliver thousands of supportive housing units um, along with integrated health, social, cultural, community and housing stability supports for people. Um, so really integrated services is the approach that the government is trying to take here. Um, 169 million capital funds to create additional complex care housing. Um, and um, we have 228 million over three years to establish new re regional multidisciplinary disciplinary teams to support rapid responses for region to responding to substantive encampments. So um, if we see those gatherings, they now have funding to set aside to actually deal with those plus 44 million to help people who are living in those encampments to actually access temporary modular housing. So those were the um, highlights for investing in affordable and attaining, attainable housing. So I'll 
pass it over to Zach again to talk about keeping BC's communities safe and healthy. Thank you. Yeah, so this section really talks about the the uh, investment into the health care and then also, um, as Dan had mentioned, with just uh, the community um, um, justice and, and security. So, so the big number was the 2.6 million is being uh, invested uh, to uh, demand an increase in cost with the aging population. So some highlights with that was 270 million going to the BC Cancer Care Plan to expand and enhance cancer care services in communities throughout the province. So something they said about was, you know, not necessarily having to travel to the bigger cities for this and being able to uh, have care closer to your home. And, and that's in addition to, to 150 million uh, going to the BC Cancer Foundation, uh, uh, which I think was already uh, um, provided. Um, and then 66 million is gonna go under the Rapid Housing Initiative to help, help people who have urgent housing needs. So, so that will help anyone that has uh, uh, any kind of urgent housing need that they would need uh, help with right away. And that could deal with, you know, climate, it could deal with, um, um, or again, if, if you have, if you're having uh, health issues. So 995 million is gonna go towards recruiting and retaining healthcare professionals. And then another uh, 1 billion towards implementing a new compensation model. So essentially they're looking at really um, um, bringing in the top healthcare professionals uh, across Canada into BC and compensating them properly so they stay in BC and operate. And I know coming from Alberta, uh, lots of doctors uh, were making the move last year from Alberta to BC. Um, so that, that's interesting just hearing it from the BC point of view that that's a big strategy of theirs. Uh, they're still contributing almost 900 million to the BC's COVID, uh, oh, that's a typo, COVID-19 response. Uh, uh, that could be one of the uh, the variants now, COVID-10, but uh, it's supposed to say COVID-19 response. And then 586 million to add treatment and recovery beds uh, throughout BC for substance use disorder. So same thing, the idea with it, if someone's uh, struggling with uh, mental health or substance use, uh, uh, let's try to get them a place to stay and, and a bed to stay in while they recover. Okay, another 184 million in response to the illicit drugs toxicity crisis, including so enhanced prevention and early intervention services, uh, uh, safe prescription alternatives uh, instead of the, the toxic drug, um, expanding mobile response programs. And again, sorry, that's another typo that shouldn't be in there, 875 that was above. So then there's 11.2 billion over three years as part of the largest ever capital investment of new healthcare infrastructure. Again, lots of that um, isn't in interior BC or uh, and is in the lower mainland, but uh, they are still you know, putting money into new healthcare infrastructure. And then 462 million to help build safe communities, improve access to justice and create support for those with mental health and addiction challenges. So that was the idea with they're going to help hire um, 256 new RCMP officers, um, 87 million in new funding supporting the launch of two new enforcement programs. So there's gonna be a new repeat violent offending uh, intervention initiative for repeat violent offenders and the new special initiative and targeted enforcement program to help uh, reduce repeat offending as well, okay? Um, and then they're gonna continue to modernize policing in BC. Budget sets out uh, uh, 25 million for consulting and public engagement to inform new policing and poli uh, po police oversight legislation and 21 million uh, to include uh, uh, cannabis licensing systems, streamlining service delivery, and state strengthening compliance and enforcement. Okay, back to uh, uh, Marina now for the, the next section. Thanks, Zach. So next I'm gonna talk advancing BC's economy. That's the next section. Um, as Dan had already mentioned, there's a limited amount of uh, stuff in here, but there is some. So the biggest one is really 48, 480 million over three years to support future ready 
work to break down barriers to training. Um, so that's really where we want to increase or advance our labor force. Um, there are 39 million set aside for new for a new grant for short-term skills training um, over three three years. Um, details, I couldn't unfortunately find any, so that details will be made available later by the government, how it's actually going to work. But it is supposed to uh, support the labor market demands and is supposed to be in alignment with the province commitment to reconciliation. Um, the second, the second one is probably the one of the few times I actually specifically talk about small and medium sized businesses in this uh, in this budget. So there is funding set aside um, to assist small and medium businesses in implementing practical solutions um, for the labor shortages. So there is also at this point no further information available but hopefully soon enough we will hear how exactly they're planning on spending this money um and then there's also additional funding to increase the numbers of trained specific uh professionals dan had mentioned that earlier so this includes early childhood educators healthcare workers and tech workers in particular that they want to focus on to fill those gaps um which we all know is uh, where we have shortages. Um, one of the other few numbers the government mentioned in their budget was there's about 100,000 people of net immigration, net migration that we had just in 2022 alone. And they're estimating about 1 million job openings over the next decade that have to be filled. So um, definitely a big area of focus for the government, but what we really want to see for the businesses as well. Um, then the next point is 58 million to expand supports for newcomers to Canada and speed up foreign credentials recognition and for, qual for qualified professionals. So that kind of is in alignment which, with what I said before, um, get foreign workers and get them moving in, into their field uh, quicker as it has happened before. Then we have 77 million over three years to help speed up natural resource permitting. Um, so this is supposed to be similar than the strategies that permitting strategies that they're putting in for the housing sector. So it's supposed to modernize and speed up the permitting delivery model uh, in the medium term. And in the short term, they're adding additional stuff to reduce permit backlogs uh, to deal with those issues. So the next point on it is the clean and sustainable economy. Um, so there are 21 million to partner with First Nations on eight more forest landscape planning project, mainly to protect more old growth. And really what they're trying to do is to get to a new approach to sustainable forest management. Um, 101 million in operating and capital funding over the fiscal plan to help and preserve um, outdoor recreational opportunities in BC parks and outdoor recreational sites. Um, and 1.1 million over the next three years to build more climate resilient communities. That includes 750 million to help communities affected by extreme cli climate related disasters. And uh, one of the other big thing that's included in this part is increased emergency management capacity. So they have put additional funds set aside for that as well. Um, and the carbon tax framework has come up a couple of times now, um, but I'll just run through it really quickly. So it will increase $15 per ton each year. The first increase is happening in a month from now, um, and it will reach $170 in 2030. Um, Zach already mentioned there is a BC's Climate Action Tax Credit that will help to offset the rising costs for most people, but how it works for businesses, that's still up in the air and there is a new industry carbon pricing system planned for April 2024. So for now they're sticking with the old one. So with hopefully more information available in the spring. So that's where it's gonna get interesting to see how they're gonna deal with that part. So that brings me to the end of this section. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fiscal plan for the next few years. Um, 
And Dan has already mentioned um, of quite a few of those points. But yes, it will be a deficit budget for all of the next three years. Um, they have made it in a way that it's at least it's a decreasing budget year over year. They have been uh, have been putting allowances on the side, so additional reserves. So they have put 700 million uh, as an allowance in there in case their revenue projections aren't going to be met. Um, and then 500 million in year two and three. So there is some leeway in the budget to for them to say at the end of the day that they did better than what they expected. Um, so to the revenue side, and we've kind of touched on this over and over again. So there's really not too much on the revenue side ha happening. So it's a gradual increase of approximately two to three billion per year. So um, not quite the increase that we have on the expense sides. Um, so the increase is really driven by the tax base and nominal growth in the economy. Uh, some offsetting lower natural resource revenue, low commodity prices and flat forestry revenues. Um, moderate growth, as we've already said, based on slower growth in the global economy, inflation, interest rates, we've already talked about all those things. So the big point here is really on the revenue side, nothing major has changed uh, other than the carbon tax that we had already talked about a couple of times. Um, so how does this debt look like? So the government's point of view is um, the debt to GDP ratio, which is a common measure, um, is still going to be below 25%, uh, even at the end of this budget, which is um, a major measure for uh, governments to see where their um, level is. But it is still a significant increase, as Dan had already mentioned. Um, so they still see capacity to borrow or refinance in the future, um, but it is a significant increase in the debt, so everybody can make their own picture on that. So. Zach is going to talk about this one for a second. Yeah, and this is just off of, uh, right off of their slide. So again, Dan had already kind of walked through the revenue numbers. As you can see, we go from 77 billion to 79 to 82. Um, and then our deficit goes from the 4.2 to the 3.8 to the 3 uh, a billion um, in the deficit line. Uh, things I wanted to focus on, and again, Dan had showed that, that again, the tax supported debt, while it's currently you know, between 63 and 75, it's going to go up to close to 100 uh, a billion by the end of the budget. They still have that at 23% of taxpayer supported debt to GDP. So that's that comment that's going to stay below 25. So that's something to monitor each year to say, okay, are they staying true to that? Or is that, you know, essentially getting blown up that, that, that debt to GDP ratio? Um. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really all I want to focus on on this versus diving into end, any of the numbers. So really, conclusion, the bu budget is focused on on spending in the areas that the provincial government are focused on and the people that they uh, uh, think are most in need. So that's renters and housing, public health, mental health and addiction, affordability and, and climate. Um, and, and again, uh, We've talked about this many times, but it's more from the individual's point of view, not necessarily affordability from the, the business, small businesses or businesses point of view. Um, there are very few areas of focus of revenue growth, like Marina said. So we have the carbon tax increase, which also leads to an offset in credit, so more money going out as well. Um, so the question is always, you know, who will pay for the deficits and how? You know, uh, 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 the provincial government sees the spending as a smart investment to tackle today's biggest challenges. That's going to lead to in continued uh, uh, people moving to British Columbia, which will lead to greater GDP growth in the future and a larger tax base. So that's how what the government sees this as. They say, listen, we have a lot of people moving to BC. If we make BC a great place to live, they're going to stay and, and more people will move here in the future and we'll have a larger tax base. Um, and, and that's what's going to take care of the deficits in the future versus increasing the taxes on each individual BC resident that lives here now, if that makes sense. So it's more about expanding the base. Um, so whether that happens or not, we'll see. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's always a nerve wracking when you see a deficit bu budget. So especially for three years. So coming from Alberta, uh, we had that uh, for for the last while. Um, and and yeah, it was uh, it was always in it was always in the news and everything, and always always top of conversation. So that that's it for for us. So it's just a little contact us sl slide for me and Marina. So again, thank you everyone for giving uh, us this opportunity. Again, being new to Kelowna, I really appreciate it, um, and would love to uh, take the time to meet as many people as possible. I'm really trying to get out to the community uh, with my wife, and we have uh, two young boys who are four and one years old. So we're really excited to be here. Yes, thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk here and. Awesome. Um, one of my first questions, Zach, was going to be, uh, where'd you come from? But I got a hint there. So um, whereabouts yeah. in Alberta? Or, and how long have you been? Yeah, so Edmonton. So uh, yeah, from Edmonton, Alberta, born and raised. And um, yeah, we've been thinking about making the move out to BC for a while and then had this opportunity through KPMG and we decided to pull the trigger. So really excited. Awesome. Great to have you here. And uh, thanks both to you and uh, Marina. I know it's not easy to digest everything. Uh, I suspect you guys had somebody in lockup. Uh, some of your I, wish, I wish. <laughs> I know. It was Marina last night on, on phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, so we uh, we have a, a time for questions for those that have gathered here. Just want to note, uh, we have recorded this, and so our team will be uh, using some of the pieces here and communicating out to our audiences. We'll make the full thing available. So uh, pretty comprehensive uh, uh, on both your parts, so thanks very much. I do have a few questions I want to go through as long as my technical challenges. I have mixed emotions. I have I think it's my PC, not my connectivity, so I'm happy that hey, maybe time for a new PC. Um, so if I cut out, I think my voice will still work and we'll work our way through that. Um, aside from the technical challenge, I want to thank Lauren for helping us back at the Chamber Headquarters uh, for moving this through. I have a micro and macro perspective on questions and I'll watch. Please use either the chat function or the Q&A function if you want to ask a quick question of other of our presenters today uh so zach maybe i'll start with you you know and, and new deal you're new to to bc and i mentioned the dueling budgets alberta tabling one at the same time doesn't happen always um but uh balanced budget in there uh versus deficit budget uh, it, is that a big deal it's interesting in bc we, we've pushed forward at the federal level and even in the canadian chamber we've eased off uh and maybe the key is managing debt load and debt to GDP, but observations yeah, on, know, on that? I think so. I think uh, this is fun. more or less of a technical answer and more of an observation of what I noticed. You know, in Alberta, when, when the, the PCs came in after the NDPs and they essentially started cutting a lot of spending, that led to a lot of uproar. So it's funny. It's, it's you, you cut spending and you try to balance the budget more. And, and lots of people aren't happy with that they want you know the people who are in need to feel supported and then those people have a loud voice as well um and then um and then and then likewise in, in when you when you do go in the deficits it really it really worries people and they get they get you know they get concerned about how are these deficits going to be paid what about the next generation are my kids going to be paying for this in taxes so you can see with alberta like it's it, it these things they flip quickly um so i don't get too concerned i agree i think it's more of a debt ratio and how much debt are you managing and then if it's like if we go on years of years of deficit and, and we don't see it getting better and we do see that debt ratio creeping up and that total debt number i think at that point it's you know that's where you need to start getting concerned so th this is key from the government perspective, uh, if they manage the debt to GDP ratio and uh, the credit rating remains. Is yeah. this likely to, I don't know from either one of you, from a macro perspective? I mean, you're not Moore's or you're not the credit rating agencies that are gonna have to defend us somewhere along the line. Uh, will it potentially, it's climbing, right? Not under 25, but yeah, I mean, it, it's climbing. And so I would say it doesn't not have an effect. Like if you think from an opinion, if you're giving out credit and or you're rating credit and someone's 
piling up more credit that's going to affect it, right? Now, I think they understand the the global economy, and I think this is uh, uh, something that's happening in in many jurisdictions across Canada and the world. So, so I, I don't know if it has a significant effect. I can't answer that, but I think I, I would imagine it has some effect. Of course, Marina, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think it's really depending on. Yeah, obviously we can't talk about or well, like don't know what the credit rate agencies are going to be thinking, but it really depends on what they're going to see for them as their future growth opportunity. Is there really, uh, you know, how how reliable is this growth of like having more people come here, bigger tax base that can support the debt? So that's that's probably one of the main things they're going to look at, and that's going to be the big question. Yeah. And then uh, we're open for questions, but I'll wrap things up and give people back uh, some of their time. But I'm curious from either perspective, um, and we're always trying to convey what we're hearing, and we've certainly hear the cost of busing business is an increased rate even throughout the pandemic. Um, but labor challenges are starting to creep up, and there's a cost associated with that. What are you hearing from your your family-owned businesses and your clients, Marina? You're pretty good, uh, Marina. You got a pretty diverse. Uh, client base too. What are you guys hearing from your clients and has the government responded in your mind for what you're hearing from your clients? Yeah, we definitely hear that from our clients as well. Everybody is saying it's, it's hard to, it's hard to fill those positions. Um, I'm regularly asked on the finance side, um, you know, like, oh, do you know anybody that, you know, can come in and do that kind of work. There's truly a shortage um, for the hospitality industry. We all know they have been struggling, but it's really all over the place. It's not one specific area. Um, and it's a lot of it is uh, relating to affordable housing that they have really challenges to, especially in like the medium paid kind of areas that, you know, Yes, they would like to live in Kelowna, but um, is that really the choice that I want to make right now? And so it's hard to attract uh, additional people. Yep. Zach, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think, you know, from the business perspective, I mean, you can think about everything from your, you know, in your personal home with your bills, your bills are going up, your cost of groceries are going up. So everything in your personal home that's happening, that's happening for small businesses, family rent businesses as well. So their their bills are going up. Their rent is going up because the renters' costs are going up for for operating the building. So so costs are rising everywhere. It's becoming more expensive to 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 fund your business. So maybe before you had, you know, some some debt and, and serviced at a lower interest rate and now it's you're refinancing. And so that's becoming more expensive. Um, um, so we yeah i think cost across the board it's becoming more challenging to run a business and you need to come up with more unique ways to drive revenue and potentially come up with uh, more more um more rev lines of revenue that that in unique ways that you can come up with new revenue streams um in terms of of staffing yeah i agree with exactly what you said marina it's uh it's a tough market where it, it's it's you know you, it's expensive to live in Kelowna. So it's hard for those, you know, those jobs that pay 50 to 80 to $90,000 a year. Well, for example, coming from Edmonton at $90,000 a year, you can buy, you know, a full single family home, no problems and, and, and live comfortably. So, so I think, I think that's the challenge with especially young people living in Kelowna. I know we have some staff at KPMG who, you know, uh, who are on, you know, they're, uh, you know, 24, 25 years old, a couple years out of school. And, and, you know, we really enjoy them. They're great staff, so we want to retain them, but we have to let them work virtually out of a different city because they just can't afford to live in Kelowna. So, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Oh, that that is helpful um, because I think it helps us really, uh, you know, roll up the sleeves and you know, reinforce. I think just not only from the chamber perspective, but the entire community and the community leaders, we need to do a better job working collaboratively to address these issues and get the attention of senior levels of government. 
Um, we'll wrap things up here. If anybody that's online has any further questions, uh, you can certainly follow up with us or follow up with uh, Marina and Zach uh, at KPMG. Thanks for, for coming on today. Um, it'll be interesting to see what gets more attention. Uh, Vancouver City Council announcing their 10% municipal budget increase. That surprised everybody a week ahead. So, or the provincial budget. Um, but I suspect that we're going to hear a lot about municipal uh, increases across the board. Uh, we heard a lot in Surrey. Um, it's making Kelowna look good um, at you know seven plus. But that that and for those that have joined us was one of the big issues that we still don't see addressed by this budget or any other budget, and we'll look forward to what the federal government does is the cumulative impact of ever-increasing pricing. And we're seeing now what many are saying is the makeup at the local government level of lower budgets during the pandemic. Uh, so we're back on accelerated budgets at the municipal level. And all the public sector, uh, and we won't get into it, but what's interesting, the public sector agencies and organizations are facing labor challenges too. So their answer, and you can see it in this budget, their increased cost for the public sector, driving up wages. So the sunshine tax that used to exist doesn't exist in the Okanagan because you won't have employees if that is. But the, out, the outcome of that is cost of labor increases and they are inflation drivers. And so I think there are some red flags here that we got to pay attention to uh, collectively, whether we're a business organization or a community leader here, to make sure those two uh, orders of government, to, particularly, because they're the big budgets and can influence provincially and federally. So thanks, both of you, for joining us. It's been great. And, you know, I often say, and I think it's uh, similar to this. If you want to find out what's important to any organization, look at its budget. So congratulations. I know you guys love this work, but thanks very much for taking some extra time uh, and joining us today and do that analysis. Thanks for having us, Dan. It was great. Excellent. Appreciate so, uh, Lauren, if you want to bring up the last few slides, uh, it wouldn't be a chamber uh, event or undertaking if I didn't plug some upcoming events. I did want to plug up uh, plug our upcoming events with uh, Dennis Trache, KPMG's Chief Mental Health Officer. Time running out to register for that event. That is set uh, for uh, early March, and well, now we're into March, so uh, set for next week. So please make sure you consider signing up for that. Time is running out. And just to hold the date uh, on March 31st will be our AGM will be at the Cabri Hotel. That AGM annual general meeting will start at 11.30. So if you remember, please come early, be set to go. The business will be conducted starting at 11.30. It'll be followed by our OOC speaker series. So on behalf of the entire team, and thanks to, to Lauren and uh, for all the work and the technical challenges, but particularly thanks to KPMG for sponsoring and putting today's uh, session together. And thanks to Zach and Marina for joining us with their budget analysis. Thanks and have a great day.